that works. All right, so whenever you're ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you do that one more time, please? Sure. <laughs> oh, wait, right. wrong one. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, then you surprised me with that one. Okay. <laughs> Or maybe at the end of the interview, you asked me to use this one. Ah! No, actually, I'll need you to use that one about halfway through the interview. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So welcome to the fourth in a series of Friday talks by Society 2045. Thank you uh, for joining us. Society 2045 is a community of people from around the world seeking to co-discover a vision for the year 2045. Our goal is to connect with leaders of emerging communities and movements across society and the spectrum of all of these movements, how they come together to create a single vision for the year 2045. Today, we have Kimberly Weefling who is one of us. She is a co-founder of Society 2045. And we're going to be interviewing Kimberly to understand her role and how 2045 is moving forward and how our vision of 2045 is emerging. So welcome Kimberly and tell us a little bit about yourself to start. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, I am a physicist by education and I, came to understand the importance of the human skills, the so-called soft skills, which are the hardest. Through my work at Hewlett Packard for 10 years in engineering and product development, and in three failed startups in Silicon Valley, and only once saw a project fail for technical reasons, and everything else was about people, teams, leadership, the organization's culture. So I have pivoted to a new understanding of the importance of those things in our world. Wow, that's great. Thank you for being so concise and direct. I love it. Uh, so the first question we ask is, what's your vision of 2045, specifically yours? Um, so how do you see 2045 emerging from where we are at today? Well, I love scenario planning and jumping to a new future without any evidence it's possible and not knowing how. So when I imagine 2045, I first embrace the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but in particular for work, the future of work is a place where there is a huge shortage of talent and the places that do not do what's required to attract and retain those talented people will go out of business because they lack the people to implement their business plans. And so it's going to be a huge, compelling, competitive advantage to have an organizational culture and framework and procedures that are not sucking your will to live. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a little playful, but in the year 2045, people will not work and suffer through that so they can have fun at night and on the weekends, it will be an integral part of their gratifying life. So let, let's unpack that a little bit because you're saying that how we work today will change. That's the first part. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that organizations will change. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that people will change. Oh, yeah, I hope so. Well, you know, I, I might give up hope, Jose, but right now I still have hope. <laughs> so in order to get to that, um, to that vision of, of where all these things have changed, is it, how are we changing? What, what do you see needs to be sort of the, the factor that needs to change? Well, so... I'll just look at some incremental changes first, although I'm more of a radical person. Um, incrementally, organizations 
that embrace more life-affirming, supportive organizational cultures and ways of interacting with people in the, in the workplace, they make more money. Um, just a simple thing, for example, organizations with more gender inclusivity, with more women in leadership roles, uh, with more women on the executive team, they make like 20% more profit. Okay, so there's no downside to uh, including women, right? And then uh, organizations that suck your will to live, and I'm living close to some of them in Silicon Valley, I won't name them, <laughs> but uh, they get people to work there who need a work visa to stay in the country, all right? And as soon as these people can quit, they do. And my friends who have worked there who are top-notch A++ performers say most miserable two years of their life. So how do you think those organizations are going to continue to attract and retain great people? They're not. The people are going to flow to the places that are more life-affirming, more supportive of a wholly integrated life. Not just, I work so I can get money to buy food so I won't starve. So I might understand that you think that what we can do is actually help these organizations change? That part of what you're trying to do is adapt the existing structures, exact, adapt the existing systems as we know them? Uh, well, uh, let me start with a little example, okay? You know, you have your chicken. Let me get a smaller chicken, better for this camera. So I just I, knew <laughs> that your chicken was gonna come out sooner it's or coming later. Out. So when I do this exercise all over the world, cause I work mostly with global companies now, mostly from Japan. And I ask people, what caused this chicken to fall? And you know what they all say? Gravity. It was gravity, Kimberly. I'm like, seriously, really? You're going to blame the earth? Oh, no, it was the chicken didn't fly. And I'm, they finally get to, Kimberly, you let it go. So now this is the problem is that I'm not trying to change organizations because there's nothing there I can grab onto. I'm trying to change people to understand that we have created these organizations. We perpetuate the toxicity and dysfunctionality of these organizations. And ain't no one coming to rescue us. We are gonna be the ones who change it. Now, I do workshops with people from all over the world, all kinds of countries, US, Europe, South America, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Australia, Thailand, Japan. And when I talk to the individual employees in, the, in today's structures, they blame the managers and all the data supports, you know, Gallup data supports the managers are number one cause of low employee engagement, but the managers blame the executives and the executives say, we'd really love to change, but we have to wait till our president dies. And the president is looking at the chairman and blaming them. And the chairman is saying, it's the economy, it's the board, what can I do? So we have a learned helplessness that's epidemic. The worst pandemic I've experienced is learned helplessness thinking someone else is responsible for the things that we are contributing to. Now, people might say, well, you're blaming me. No, I'm not blaming you. I'm telling you, you have power. Because if we accept that we are contributing to the crap we're complaining about, then we have power to do something to change it. So am I right in understanding that what you're suggesting is we hold on to our chicken? Yes, hold on <laughs> to the freaking chicken. Don't let the chicken go. Now, I'm not saying that we're all powerful, Jose. I don't want people to misunderstand. There are circumstances outside of our control. There is gravity. I just don't want to focus on the things that are outside of my control at the expense of owning my own power over the situation. I love it. And so let, let's unpack that a little bit more. Uh, not so much today, but let's unpack that in, at 2045. In 24 years... I'm going to go to work and how am I thinking different? How am I acting different? Assuming your vision for that year comes through, what, what is different in my day-to-day -day life and the, in my role in the organization? What, what does that look like more specifically from a personal perspective? Okay, so again, without knowing how, I will just tell you, for me, I've made huge changes in the last 20 years. 
for me, work is decoupled from survival. So in 2045, if anything were possible and not knowing how, people do not go to work so that they can survive, you know, pay their mortgage, get food to eat, make sure that their kids can go to college. People go to work to contribute to our world in ways that are important for the world and gratifying for them. And now I got a chance to experiment with this in 2020. I'd have to wait to 2045 because thank God there was a crazy, horrible, tragic pandemic, which totally destroyed my entire business as I knew it. And I reached out to my clients around the world, including big, huge companies, which will remain nameless. And I said, pandemic pricing. I do it for free in exchange for the opportunity to learn and grow. And you give me some feedback. And it was some of the most gratifying and even fun work of my life. And I wasn't getting paid anything for it. Now, that's because I didn't really need money to survive because I'm in a good situation. But there's plenty on planet Earth for everybody to have enough to eat, to drink, to live a decent life, have health care, you know, access to clean water, education. There, If we were committed to making sure everybody had these basic human needs, then work would be a contribution it wouldn't be a task. That's beautiful. So I'm, I'm now integrating work into my life rather than do, integrating myself into work. And at the organization level, what, what does that look like now? What does the organization look like? Oh, have you ever seen a flock of birds? like 10 or 20,000 starlings all flying around and making these different shapes and patterns? There's no CEO bird. There's no bird organization chart. They don't have bird executive teams. They have working together, operating agreements, how far to stay away from each bird. And they self-organize. And I envision a world where the work that needs to be done is made obvious through some means I haven't yet imagined. And that those who are compelled and moved to do that work gather around it. And when that work is done, they gather around the next thing. Now, there might be more sustainable structures that continue, but I think a lot of it will be created and will persist for a while and then will dissolve back into the community to be emerging somewhere else. And this is is kind of based on my physics background, right? It's chaos, it's complexity, it's emergence to fill the need rather than command and control, which by the way, even the U S military does not use in combat operations anymore. And so what I'm hearing, and this is getting me all excited. So what I'm hearing is that it's emergent that these, these organization type things, whatever that looks like is an emergent thing. But Mm -hmm. also I wonder then if it's emergent for me to have a specific organization that I'm working with because of the, the current need, is it possible that there are multiple organizations that I'm contributing to? Oh, because- it's essential. It's essential. I mean, I'm working with a number of different so-called companies. These companies are nothing more than a website. I mean, it's a group of people that come together to meet a need, and then we disperse and they go about their business. We come together with a different group for another purpose. And I have the freedom to do that right now because my work is decoupled from my financial needs to survive. But I envision a world where everybody could afford to self-organize around whatever emergent needs there are in multiple communities. Is it possible, do you think, that we could... Sorry to cut you off there. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. I was going to say, is is it possible, do you think, to uh, envision that what you've just described but that we not only have protocols for how we work together, but we have protocols for how we compensate that are just as uh, emergent rather than this, uh, I get hired and somebody gets to tell me what to do and I'm Uh, an employee and all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I think if people come together and do something of value, create value, receive value, then they should share that value in some equitable way. I've been experimenting with that in my Silicon Valley Alliances tribe. Um, 
we pull people in to work on different kinds of projects, sometimes with huge companies that everybody knows the name. And at the end, when we get paid by those granite traditional organizations, I put up a big Google spreadsheet and I ask everybody who was on the team that delivered, how much do you think you should get? How much do you think I should get? Please give the percentages. And then we get maybe two, three, four, five people weighing in on what percentage everybody should get. And then as the person who was the lead pulling people in, I have to decide. And what I've been doing for the last four or five years, I pay everybody else a little bit more than they say they deserve. And I pay myself a little bit less than they think I deserve. And everyone's been pretty happy with that. So it's really uh, revenue sharing. Of course, we pay all the expenses up front and it's completely open and transparent. Everybody can see what everybody got. And the cool thing is this, hey, if you don't treat me right financially when I'm on your team, I'm not gonna invite you to my team. So this is based on kind of an iterated prisoner's dilemma model with reputation score where how you treat each other carries forward to the other interactions that you're gonna have together in your community and your reputation influences how other people who didn't work with you think about you. I call that interdependence. Ah, I love it. Tell me more about interdependence. Well, it's, this interview is not about me. It's about you. <laughs> so, <Thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I, I'm really liking the picture. The picture, though, you keep saying that you don't know how to, but it sounds like you are doing it. Right. I am experimenting. I'm a cut and try kind of girl. I do prototypes. I do iterations. It's a design thinking approach. Heck, I'm in Silicon Valley. So here we build success on a big pile of failures. We don't call them failures, though. We call them prototypes. So <laughs> I've been experimenting and it hasn't always worked perfectly. There's been some misunderstandings. Uh, but I think we have to be committed to finding new ways of working together. And for me, the worst thing that could possibly happen is for me to be offered a full-time steady job with a steady paycheck. I very much know the feeling. <laughs> so... So let me ask you a couple of questions because we're going to be running out of time if we don't get to these. Mm. Um, first of all, this vision that you've just described, which I love, if, what, what part of, I shouldn't say if, what part of the other movements that are out there, many of our colleagues here at Society 2045, others around the world that you know of, um, which of them do you think needs to become um, successful in their vision in order to enable the vision that you've just described? Well, I've watched the holacracy movement and I have to say that organizations are never gonna be completely flat. Everybody knows who was the founder. There's always hierarchy. And by the way, the human brain really likes hierarchy because status, when we're denied status, the, the firing in our brain is like the same as physical pain. So I don't think that just trying to flatten the organizational structure is a complete panacea. I do think it will move us a little closer to where we need to be. If somehow we got to the point where there was a huge, totally transparent dashboard, a global marketplace of what needs to be done and who's out there to do it. And there was some kind of AI engine matching us up with the opportunities and making sure that the rewards were fairly shared, then it would be easy and effortless. I'd get up every day, I'd punch up my dashboard and it would say, oh, there's seven things in the local area and 15 things virtually that you could do today, Kimberly, that would contribute to something of value and some of them are highly compensated and some of them are not, but then I would choose based on what makes sense for me, my needs and my desires. Maybe you can invent it. We, we've already done so, but that's a, that's a different story because part of a, a group that uh, I participate in is, is creating something we call uh, One Life. And mm -hmm. that very much is what we're talking about is that process of being able to identify what impact do we want to make? Mm -hmm. Because that's a big part of how, uh, if we're going to move down this path, we need to understand that 
if we're going to identify impacts for ourselves, we need to know who else is working on those impacts so that we can join them and they can join us, vice versa. So um, do you see some roadblocks possibly? Like what, what, the other question, the opposite question to the one I just asked is, okay, so what of these different visions of the future that are out there from, from other movements, are any of them things that you think, well, if, if that comes about, this is going to be a problem for us? Oh, yeah. Now I got to tread into dangerous territory because this can easily be misinterpreted. But I want to say that I don't think any human being on planet Earth should have to worry about will they have food, water, a safe place to live, health care and access to education. That should be kind of a no brainer. Everybody has access to that by virtue of being on planet earth. I'm not saying socialism, I'm saying humanize our life on planet earth. It's just unconscionable to me that I live near San Francisco where one in five kids is hungry. I don't feel good about that. Um, I also don't understand how people can sleep at night with that going on. So we have to find a way to say, hey, let's create some kind of basement uh, we all have our basic needs met. And then we work to contribute, to have meaning in our lives and for joy and to build a reputation score. Because, you know, even in the, the jungle, I think certain tribes of monkeys, if you don't share, they attack you, right? The other monkeys attack you. So they keep track of which monkeys share and which monkeys don't. So there's always going to be some sociopath or psychopathic people who won't share and just take and take and take. But over 90% of us, I believe, will contribute to the rising tide that lifts all boats. And what's more than that, if you can match people to things that they're great at, you're not trying to get a fish to climb a tree, right? If you want to climb a tree, you say, hey, who's got a squirrel? <laughs> and so those are the kind of experiences that we're going to shift towards where work is not a survival mechanism. It's a gratification and contribution and reputation building mechanism. And we are actually thrilled to be able to uh, contribute what we're great at. Like, like why, does, why does Warren Buffett continue to work? What could he possibly need? Right. He's giving away 99 percent or more of his total worth. He doesn't work for money. That's what I want everybody, everybody to be working for the gratification that they get from work. As I said, that's a beautiful vision. I, I certainly subscribe to that. Um, so last question for you. If, if this vision is realized and we get to 2045 exactly as you've just described, what do you think the rest of society looks like? Not work, but our families, our communities. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, Jose, because there's going to be still this need for status. So people are going to perhaps compete to be the most giving or compete to be the most contributing to their community or to do the most good for planet Earth, right? So status might take a whole nother bent in the direction of what good are you bringing to our world? And that's what's respected. And what we value now, what some people value now, the glitz, the, the fame, the richness, going to outer space and spending trillions of dollars like that, that might not be so well respected. It, it might be more valued to help children uh, learn values and explore their strengths and learn to evolve into the highest and best version of themselves. Well, well thank you very much for that. That's, um, that's a, a, an amazing vision. I love it. And I think it, it obviously fits very well within the 2045 vision that we've all been co-creating. Um, well, and I just want a warning to people who hear this and think, oh, that's impossible. In 1895, Lord Kelvin, physicist and mathematician and head of the British Royal Society, he said, 
heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Okay. He didn't say they would take hundreds or thousands of years and rely on technology. I can barely understand. He said heavier than air flying machines are impossible. And this is when there were birds. Okay. Birds are heavier than air. And so right now we're in the midst of examples of exactly what I've described. And yet there will be people who say it's impossible. It can't be done. Well, less than 10 years after he said it was impossible, there were flying machines called airplanes. And this is what's going to happen because the alternative is to devolve into a society I don't want to wake up to. Nor do I, <laughs> nor do I. Kimberly, thank you so much. This was a, an amazing, amazing conversation. I hope we get to do this again. Thank Thank you. you. (laughs) (laughs) To all the chickens in the world. Thank you, Kimberly. All right, so we'll leave it there. I am going to do a clap, clap, clap for the video so that it's easier to edit. And now we can ask some questions if we want. Um, Stuart, would you like to ask some questions of Kimberly? You know, I, 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 I really don't have any questions because, <laughs> because my vision is so perfectly aligned, okay? You know, it's just, that's, 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 that's it. I know um, she made it really hard for me too because I kept thinking, okay, what do I ask now? Because well, I'm I have nothing to probe. I have nothing to go uh, into and say, but, but, but. Uh, right. Hey, there's no I, there's, there's no buts here. Mm-hmm. I spent plenty of years, and I'm gonna use this term, it's a little dangerous, but I felt for many years I was a wage slave. I did a job I didn't really like with people who didn't treat me right for a company I didn't respect just because I had to, to survive. Then one day, a few years ago, I realized I have enough for beer and pretzels retirement. And at that date, I said, I'm not doing anything for money that I wouldn't do for free. And I have been true to that. I have fired clients. I go in and work with clients like this. I'm going to either be successful at helping you make the necessary changes or you're going to fire me. I honestly don't care which. And that has freed me to work completely in alignment with my ethics. Okay, so great. So, so thank you for saying that, Kimberly. So, so now I have a question. Okay. <laughs> question just arose. I mean, I share your vision of um, there being an existence of safety net. And I, I don't even mean a safety net. I mean... All right, so my premise is that we don't have a resource problem on planet Earth. We have a distribution channel challenge. There's more than enough here for everyone. It's a question of getting enough to everyone so that each individual can pursue their artistic talents, their best work, um, and, and live a, a life of freedom, okay? Um, so any thoughts about how we actually get there from here in terms of um, practical programs, um, changes of thinking. Um, There you go. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's just take the issue of stuff, stuff that we think we want or need. There is something on Facebook called Buy Nothing, and each community organizes around this Buy Nothing. So I'm in Buy Nothing Redwood City. If I go and look at what's out there, there is everything from baby clothes to frozen burritos to people asking for used makeup. And you go out there and if you look down the list, there's all kinds of things. You don't have to go to the store. You can share. It can be the community resource pool. And I think that's easier to do locally because people can go over to each other's house and get stuff. Um, So I think sharing the excesses rather than wasting it will go a long way in that direction. Plus, look at a larger scale. In India, for example, where there's so much poverty and hunger, if there was no food rotting in India, there'd be a net surplus and there would be exporting. I know this because one of my clients 
makes an oxygen barrier that's used for a giant grain bag that can keep grain from rotting for long periods of time. They also make a barrier that's used in Africa where there's only like one refrigerator for every 20 people and milk from cows instead of the 70% that rots before it gets to consumers, it can last for two weeks in these sealed pouches without refrigeration. So we find ways to channel the waste into some use for people. And I think if we start sharing our excesses instead of wasting them, we're gonna raise the tide that lifts all boats pretty quickly. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I, I, I get that, I get that. And, and that, you know, what you just said, Kimberly, just, you know, validates the thesis that there's more than enough for everyone. Um, and, and yeah, so. Well, there won't be, there won't be, it depends. If you look at the World Business Council for Sustainable Developments, Vision 2050 and Action 2020, their prediction was we might go over 9 billion in population on planet Earth which if everybody wants to live this lifestyle would require 2.3 earths. Right. Okay, so, and the best case scenario when they did this back in 2010, I guess, was they would only need 1.1 earth. So we are on a path where population could drive us to scarcity. So I do think we need to be understanding that we need to be concerned about the limits to growth, just like we should have been last century. Yeah, um, I think you will. Um, I, I don't think I've sent it to either one of you. Um, my beginning of the science fiction novel, and I've identified, I've identified like 37 areas that need attention to get from where we are to where we might want to be. And, you know, population is, is certainly um, one of them. So I'll send that paper to both of you guys. Yeah, I'd love that. Mm -hmm. I mean, can, but can you imagine education now is free? You can get a Harvard quality education for free. You can't get the little certificate, but you, there's no excuse for being uneducated. And what we need to do, except for, okay, we don't have access to good internet. I'm also working with the people centered internet and the global help desk to say, why are there like 20% of Americans that don't have access to broadband, let alone the billions on planet earth. So we do need to fix this digital divide so that we can help people come together to this new future with us. Otherwise, we're gonna be even farther apart than the have-nots. Yeah, um, absolute, ab abs absolutely. Um, I bet that you know a lot of the organizations that are actually working on um, the challenges that I've identified. I'd love to see it. Great, cool. Yeah. And each person, right, the, the problem is it's easy to get discouraged. What do I do? I'm this little drop of water in the ocean. So we need to somehow create a dashboard for planet Earth so people can perceive their positive or negative impact on our world. I worked many years ago on the Silicon Valley Sim Center trying to, to do something like that, and it didn't go anywhere. It was just a, an experiment. But if you... <sighs> If you can see your contribution and your impact on where the needle is or where the level is, you will have like 60% more discretionary effort directed towards those goals. Like think of the United Way thermometer fundraising. You have a thermometer. Here's where we are. Here's where we want to be. And people know exactly what to do when they look at that thermometer. You add money, it makes the red go up. And so we need to make it much more clear people's consequences of their choices, of their actions on themselves, their communities, and our world. So I've got another question that popped up, all right? And, um, and, the, and the question that pops up in my mind, so Kimberly, you live in Silicon Valley, okay? And you know this is where a lot of action is in the world in terms of you know, artificial intelligence. It's attracted kind of great thinkers, um, you know, we all know that technology has, has changed the world, right? Mm -hmm. So we are currently in this planetary conversation that's been going on, and I appreciate your presentation. What are you finding in Silicon Valley in terms of the numbers of people that are actually um, in a conversation this big? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I struggle because here I am, have this physics background and this high tech experience. And yet I understand that without human skills, without empathy, without awareness of our impact on this world, it's really like doing the wrong things faster and more efficiently, right? If, if we don't have our values right, if we don't have our empathy, if we're not tuned into our fellow humans, then AI and machine learning just helps us do stupid things more efficiently. So I think it's really dangerous to have a purely tech mindset. Now it's starting to be recognized that a tech mindset without appropriate empathy and organizational culture and human skills, what some of my friends call touchy feely crap, without that, it's really a sociological disaster. And I think we can see that kind of thing in WeWork or uh, Uber, the kinds of things where billions of dollars in valuation evaporates overnight because they didn't think about leadership and the quality of their organization and their team. And I think more and more investors, investors are starting to understand this doesn't work. And so they're starting to ask, not for the right reasons, they're starting to ask because they want to make more money. Let's do these soft skills, human skills, leadership skills. I mean, I don't think we can really fix it by just upgrading the existing organizations. I do think it's kind of an interim solution. We do need to get to a place where people are all like me saying, I'm not doing anything for money that I wouldn't do for free. And I'm going to do only what needs a Kimberly. I'm a fish. If you need to climb a tree, I'll help you find a squirrel. So from your experience, do you think that we have the um, capacity um, and the knowledge to transform people and to do it quickly? Yeah, actually, that's so funny because I was so surprised. I was invited 2007 to start going to Japan. I've been to Japan over 100 times. I work mainly with Japanese companies like Yamaha Motors, Kurare, and other big companies. And I was hoping I could help them, but I was amazed. Even in like a one-day workshop, they contact me and say, Kimberly, you have changed me. Not just Japanese people either. And so uh, one company, we did like an eight-year experiment. We did a three-day workshop. Basically, I would summarize it as saying how not to be a boss hole. And that three-day workshop, we did it 16 times. Uh, we had over 250 graduates. And this is a company that does business in 110 different countries in the world. And it's one of the top five companies in Japan. And they had 22% of people quitting every year. But when they looked at my graduates over a seven-year period, only 13 people out of 250 had quit in seven years. Now I said, oh no, come on, you sent me people unlikely to quit. And they said, no, because they also checked the people who reported to my graduates who had never met me and my team and only 12% of them quit. So we were able to reduce voluntary turnover from 22% to 12% among people who never met us just by teaching their managers how not to be a boss hole. So, so yeah. So it sounds it sounds like um, that you, through your own experience, believe that business can be a great vehicle for um, for social change and human change and and contribution to the planet. Well, look, I work with some companies doing business in over a hundred countries. They have more influence than most governments. And then you look at a company like, what is it, Walmart, that has 2.3 million employees. That's more people than some countries on planet Earth. So yes, if we can enlighten the consciousness of the human beings in these big organizations that are so-called leading them and help them understand that embracing this new paradigm will actually increase revenue, increase profit, reduce voluntary turnover, increase customer sat, increase quality, reduce theft. Everything gets better when you do these things. I think we're going to have a much greater impact than any government and even the United Nations. So uh, I know some organizational consultants who have completely given up on that possibility 
thinking that that the systems in place and the mindset in place are are just um, make it kind of impossible to um, manifest the vision that you're talking about. What would you say to them? Well, I'd say read about Lord Kelvin and <laughs> say things are impossible. And uh, it's easy to say impossible. And what, what does it mean? When people say something's impossible, what does it mean? Well, just think about, Stuart, Jose, what percent of everything in the entire universe do you personally know? What percent? Is it, you know, 50%, 20%? <laughs> well, yeah, most people tell me less than 1%. So when somebody says something's impossible, it means whatever they know, the little 1% that they know, they can't imagine how to do it. But something in the 99% that they don't know could make it possible, maybe even easy, perhaps inevitable. So I would say be open to the possibility that something outside of your own experience and knowledge could make impossible inevitable. Great. I, I so appreciate your um, enthusiasm, Kimberly. It's just, it's just so incredibly um, refreshing to watch and to, and to listen, especially from, you know, with someone who's got a, a technical and scientific um, background. That's right. I am a scientist. I look at data and you can always find evidence of why things won't work. In fact, Negative people appear smarter. There is a payoff for criticizing, condemning, and complaining. And I call them the cave people, citizens against virtually everything, right? So but for what I prefer to do is to say, okay, what's possible? What seems impossible, but if it were possible, would transform whatever we're trying to transform for the better. And then what might make impossible possible? Take necessary risks, experiment, prototype, learn from mistakes, and fail forward together. Now, if we can create that kind of environment, that is going to transform the planet. You're right. There are some organizations that will never change. There are people who will hold on to their power. There are dictators. There are tyrants. Absolutely. And if you want to find examples of other kinds of organizations and other kinds of leaderships, they are out there as well. And if you and I have a choice, which leaders to be attracted to, I think you know which we would choose, right? Yeah. Can we do it fast enough? <laughs> um, um, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. I haven't run the simulations. <laughs> <laughs> I worry. I worry that it's not fast enough. And I especially worry about can we stay ahead of the needs because of the population growth on the planet? You know, if we could say today, let's give everybody everything they need for basic subsistence, then a couple of years from now, we're another 100 million people that we need to deal with. It may be that our problems grow faster than our ability to deal with them. I don't know. I hope not. I personally didn't have any children specifically because of this reason. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to sorry to be jumping in so much here, Jose. No, it. no, no, no. This is, these are great questions. Uh, Matt does the editing, so we'll see how much he he. he Cut it off. <laughs> uh, but uh, why, why don't we wrap it up there, though? That okay. way we can uh, give him uh, not too many hours of editing. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you, Stuart. It's been a delight. <laughs>